this paper develops a theme that I've been working on for a couple of years, and it concerns the question of how we're to view the nature of desire and its relation to value, humanity, and God. I've written about Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, and Levinas in this context, and I want today to add Sartre to the equation. Now, it's agreed on all sides by all of my protagonists that desire is inextricably tied up with what it means to be human. But this has led to very different conclusions about the nature and value of our predicament, given the differing conceptions of desire at work in the relevant discussions. My focus for today's discussion concerns the distinction between two seemingly mutually exclusive ways of thinking about desire, namely as lack or deficiency, option one, or as plenitude or creativity, option two. What it means to think of desire in either of these ways is obscure, and it'll be a task of my paper to offer some clarification. We can note at this preliminary stage, however, that the distinction between lack and creativity is acknowledged by Plato in the Symposium with an approving nod to the second creative conception in Diotima's speech. And this conception is likewise operative in the work of many religious thinkers, all of whom insist that this creative model fits the desire for God. Now, this latter point, that this creative model is used by a lot of religious thinkers, has been of the utmost significance to me, for it's a growing theme in contemporary Nietzschean scholarship, and more generally in the grand narrative of Western metaphysics as presented from this perspective, that anybody who has anything to do with God is committed to thinking of desire as a kind of lack, and that this conception goes hand in hand with a distrust and hatred of desire, and by implication, all things human. The Nietzschean, by contrast, proposes an alternative conception of desire, which corresponds to the second creative option, and which is intended to rescue us from the despair of passive nihilism, where we give up on the world and human life to succumb to nothingness. This is how the official story goes, at least, and some of its elements replayed in the following words of the atheist philosopher Gilles Deleuze on your sheet, taken from an interview. Desire, he says, who except priests would want to call it lack? Those who link desire to lack, the long column of crooners of castration, clearly indicate a long resentment, like an interminable bad conscience. Now, this quotation suits my purposes at several levels. First, one of my protagonists, Sartre, treats desire as a kind of lack, but he's about as far removed from a priest as one could imagine. He does, however, possess a Nietzschean kind of religious sensibility, describing himself as an atheist who's obsessed with God's absence. Second, Levinas, another protagonist, rejects this lack model of desire to defend an alternative which sounds a lot like the creative conception endorsed by Deleuze and Nietzsche. Crucially, however, Levinas is a theist. Third, and differences notwithstanding, Sartre and Levinas both insist that desire is oriented towards God in some sense, that it's insatiable and that it's fundamental to what it means to be human. The Nietzschean, by contrast, rejects all reference to God, but he agrees that desire is central to what it means to be human and wants to be able to make sense of its insatiability. Now, what little I've said rules out the imposition of a straightforward disjunction between those religious types who treat desire as a kind of lack and those, the atheists, who do not. In what follows, I want to clarify, link, and distinguish the relevant conceptions of desire, all the better to challenge the assumption that religion is the enemy of desire, and hence life, and to get a clearer and less ideologically loaded picture of what it means to comprehend desire in either or both of these ways. I shall question Sartre's insistence that man is a useless passion. 
trace it back to his commitment to his lack model of desire, and argue that this model stands in the way of the more creative conception, which is lurking in the background of his account. There'll be a question of whether the atheist is then entitled to this creative conception, and I shall challenge his assumption that it becomes available only when theism is overthrown. I shall suggest also that there's something important to be salvaged from the lack model. So I'm now moving on to section two, um, where I'm going to talk a bit about what Sartre says about desire as lack and the desire to be God. And the quotations that I'm using here are mostly on your sheet. In Being a Nothingness, Sartre tells us that, quote, to be man means to reach towards being God. Or, if you prefer, man fundamentally is the desire to be God. In offering this conception of man, Sartre is in agreement with all those who posit a fundamental desire to underlie and structure all other desires. Think of the concept of eros in Plato's Symposium, Freud's libido, Schopenhauer's will, and the desire for God as proposed by theologians like Augustine and Aquinas. The typical theologian's conception of the desire for God is not a desire to be God, although he's happy to talk of wanting union in this context. And we shall see from Levinas that it makes sense to say of one who gives expression to such desire in the context of a human life that she does God's work, taking over from him in this respect. However, it's no part of such a picture that God has been jettisoned in favour of man, although it's a common theological thought that there is a diabolical temptation in this direction. As Heidegger puts it, man contends for the position in which he can be that particular being who gives the measure for everything that is, the desire to be God. Sartre is an atheist, albeit one who finds God's absence both distressing, quotes, all possibility of finding values in a heaven of ideas disappears along with him, and liberating. We're alone, nothing to cling to, and with no excuses. The God he rejects is defined in opposition to man, and with reference to the metaphysical framework, it's his purpose to defend, in being a nothingness at least. Thus understood, God represents an ideal synthesis of being and consciousness, in itself for itself, as Sartre puts it, in deference to the Hegelian language he inherits, although the, basics are, the basic idea is familiar from much traditional theology. God is being in itself by virtue of involving no lack, no longing, no imperfection. He is being for itself by virtue of being self-conscious and self-grounding. Sartre associates this ideal with beauty, love and supreme value, but claims that it's an impossible synthesis because the relevant dimensions of being cannot be validly coordinated, inevitably so if selfhood is inextricably tied to lack. He concludes, Sartre concludes that God and the associated values cannot exist. Now, Sartre's reasoning in all of this can be disputed, and there's a question of how seriously he takes these rational considerations in any case. Either way, he remains steadfast in his atheism and denies on this basis that the desire to be God can be satisfied. So man cannot become God and this, for Sartre, means that the desiring subject is a useless passion. Man desires to be God, but this aim can never be completed. It's in this sense that we are incomplete or lacking beings, defined by an impossible desire. Desire itself being understood as a lack within the subject. And all of these quotes now are on your sheet. As Sartre says, Desire shows that human reality is a lack. Desire is the being of human reality. It is an incomplete circle that calls for completion. It's a lack of being. It is haunted in its inmost being by the being of which it is desire. 
it bears witness to the existence of lack in the being of human reality. We're said to experience ourselves as failures in this respect. Quote, the for itself in its being is failure in the presence of the being which it has failed to be. We're haunted by and thirst for being. Now, we can agree that we lack the perfections of God, and it makes sense to say that we're incomplete in this respect, but only on the assumption that we're to be defined in contrast to such a being. Sartre claims not merely that we're lacking in this respect, but that this lack manifests itself as desire, that this desire is fundamental to our motivational makeup, and that it's a desire to be God. He claims also that we thirst for God and that this thirst is experienced as a deficiency or failure. The idea that we thirst for God is familiar from biblical and theological literature. And al although the imagery brings connotations of wanting to assimilate or possess, it's more properly understood in these contexts at least as capturing the mesmeric attraction at issue when we're drawn towards God in this manner. Sartre seems at times to be conceding to this kind of picture when, for example, he talks of desire being haunted by the being of which it's desire. However, such a picture is at odds with his atheism and it's at odds also with his more prevalent message that the desire in question wants to be the being it desires. Thus far, the message seems predominantly bleak. The desiring subject can never find the fulfilment she craves. She's irreducibly happy, unhappy in this respect and filled with a sense of failure. So our experience as desiring beings is tied up with this sense of failure. And Sartre takes us to be borne out in the frustrations we experience at the level of everyday desires and satisfactions, and in our attempts to find happiness in the realm of interpersonal relationship. He's a bit like Schopenhauer in this respect. Erotic love is just one more context in which the desire to be God is enacted and frustrated, this time in one's desire to be God in the eye of the beloved. And the problem extends more generally to undermine the possibility of love across the board. As Kate Kirkpatrick puts it in her recent book on Sartre and Sin, his critique of love, quotes, which seeks and fails to fulfil the lover's lack, extends to all human loves. Every profession of love, on his view, is a masquerade, and more proper masquerades not only as eros, but as agape and philia. Other people are simply cast-offs we leave behind in the wake of our self-aggrandissement. So that there's no love, properly so-called, in Sartre's worldview, which helps to explain why God, whom Sartre associates with love, appears only in the guise of an egoistic desire to take his place. All is not entirely bleak, however, for in the midst of this abyss, and that word's going to be quite important to what goes on later. In the midst of this abyss, there emerges a more optimistic picture, one which follows on from the picture of human reality as lack, and which suggests that it has the potential, this lack, to bring forth a kind of creativity or productivity. It does so in two senses. First, we're told that, quote, desire by itself tends to perpetuate itself. Man clings ferociously to his desires. And Stephen Wang talks in this context of, quotes, the refusal to rest satisfied, the constant push forward, the necessity of going beyond and building something new. Second, our nature as lacking beings is bound up with our freedom. For freedom, quotes, coincides at its roots with the non-being which is at the heart of man. And for a human being, to be is to choose himself. Nothing comes to him either from without or from within himself that he can receive or accept. That's going to be an important thought too. Nothing comes to him either from without or from within himself that he can receive or accept. He is wholly and helplessly at the mercy of the unendurable necessity to make himself be. So 
such was the idea that we cling ferociously to our desires when wedded to the suggestion that they are experienced as a source of pain, brings to mind a rather desperate insistence of the ego or will. It might be thought to suggest also, however, that they're a force for the good, motivating us to pursue our ends and make something of ourselves in the process. We're to suppose that this is a uniquely human way of existing, and it's clear from what he goes on to say that desire's productivity in this context is inextricably tied up with the possibility of value. Having seemingly ruled out in the above quotation, that bit about not receiving anything from without, that value could have its source in something beyond the subject, Sartre speculates that our freedom will reveal itself as, quote, the unique source of value and the nothingness by which the world exists. The moral agent, he continues, will see that he is the being by whom values exist. This possibility and its consequences is left open at the end of being a nothingness, and it's left equally open that freedom will remain ever defined, quotes, in relation to a transcendent value which haunts it, where in Sartre's terminology that would involve going on living in bad faith, and it's not entirely clear whether he thinks it's possible to avoid that bad faith. So, Sartre seeks to defend the possibility of reinventing meaning and value in a world without God. I mean, that seems to be a pretty fair summary, I think. Desire is a fundamental ingredient in this context because there's value to be found in desire. We cling ferociously to them. They move us to pursue our ends. And desire involves a kind of creativity in, this, in these respects. Now, the creativity at issue here concerns desire's motivating force. And Sartre wants to reject any explanation which involves reference to an independently existing realm of value. So there are no prospects for saying that value motivates our desires. And the alternative seems to involve tracing the source of value to the desiring subject, whatever this really means. Now, one thing it could mean is that value is determined by the desiring subject in the sense that X is, valued if X is valuable if X is desired. However, this seems to involve just one more attempt to play at being God if um, extended across the board to generate value wholesale. It just seems to be one more attempt to play at being God, a hopeless attempt if, in line with the official metaphysics, desire and value are to be dualistically opposed. By contrast, if this framework is rejected, this dualistic framework, then the question is whether there is an alternative conception of desire, which is better equipped to accommodate its creative and value produ producing potential. It is a task of the following section to explore this possibility, initially in the context of an atheistic framework, which purports to free us once and for all from the transcendent value that haunts us. So this is section three from Lack to Creativity. Now, I've said already that the Lack model of desire is a familiar object of attack um, for a certain kind of Nietzschean. Such a figure shares Sartre's atheistic stance but insist that such a model is symptomatic of the theistic framework to which we remain beholden. No wonder it's so difficult to make sense of meaning and value if our framework dictates that they're unattainable. So it's agreed that we're desiring beings and that desire is a distinctively human capacity which is tied up with life and value. What is denied, however, is that these connections can be made good from within a lack involving conception of desire. And what I'm going to do now is to quote from Robert Pippin, and a lot of my discussion is tied up with his attempts across a series of papers to grapple with this kind of issue. And I just want to emphasise that I think his work is absolutely brilliant. And, you know, if I appear to be disagreeing with him from time to time, it's it's not because I don't think his work is really fantastic. I think that he's put his finger on a really important topic. And um, 
I'm not entirely clear what one should be saying in this context, and I'm just struggling with it myself and have been across a few papers as well. So anyway, this is how Pippin sums up the agenda for the Nietzschean. We want a picture of striving without the illusion of a determinate natural lack that we can fill. To anyone, and this quote's on your sheet, to anyone with an intellectual conscience, it will have to feel as though there, can just, there just can be no human whole, not as proposed by Plato or Aristotle or Christianity or Schiller or Hegel and so forth. And yet it can't just not matter that there can be no such harmony or completion because all of the ways we have come to think about such desire start out from these assumptions about caused needs or an incompleteness that we strive to complete. Now, the first thing that we might say about this is, well, it's not invariably an illusion to suppose that striving involves a determinate natural lack that we can fill, for the picture appropriately fits at least some of our desires. I'm, I'm going to say towards the end that we might need to salvage the lack model in some sense, but I'm thinking at this stage of our appetitive desires, those desires are issue when we feel hunger and thirst, not the thirst for God. Levinas will describe these appetitive desires in precisely these lack involving terms, classifying them as needs and claiming that they stem from a lack in the subject, which is filled by consuming or assimilating, as he puts it, an object that satisfies the desire. As he puts it, I can feed on these realities and to a very great extent satisfy myself as though I'd simply been lacking them. You know, like when you drink a glass of water and your thirst disappears. Now, Levinas wants to say that these desires rightly have their origin in us. They stem from our biological nature. And Levinas is anxious to distinguish them from the kind of desire which is at issue in the present discussion, namely that which is fundamental to what it means to be human and inextricably tied up with the question of value. And Pippin is all, also going to distinguish the desire with which he is concerned from everyday satisfactions and dissatisfactions. So they're in agreement on this score. So let us grant that there could be a picture of striving without the illusion of a determinate natural lack that we can fill, to put it in Pippin's terms. But how, how are its details to be understood? Pippin introduces the proposed alternative in the context of a discussion of the death of God and Nietzsche's remark that Brahms does not create out of an abundance he languishes for abundance. Poor Brahms. It's, I don't know. So this is what Pippin says. And I think this is a quotation that you probably need to read about a hundred times because it's, I mean, not because it's incomprehensible, but because it's so deep. He says, this distinction between desire as a lack and the death of God as a new lack and desire as abundance excess and so sorry <laughs> this one let's start again this distinction be dis between desire as a lack and the death of god as a new lack and desire as abundance excess and so the death of god as freeing such generosity and excess will emerge frequently in what follows okay so we've got this distinction between desire as a lack and desire as a kind of abundance so I'm now just going to try and say a bit more about what maybe is going on here. So we're familiar with the idea of desire as lack. It's associated with the theistic picture to be rejected and involves seeing the desiring subject as striving towards a completion or perfection that she lacks, either contingently or in principle, in principle for Sartre. The suggestion now is that one who is wedded to this conception of the desiring subject will take God's absence to be a further expression of the relevant lack or a new occasion for languishing in it. Oh, God doesn't exist, how terrible this is, and my predicament is tragic, and I might as well kill myself sort of idea. Now, this provides an accurate description of Sartre's position, without the kill myself bit. 
By contrast, there is an alternative conception of desire, which is supposed to liberate us from this tragic conception of humanity and which becomes available only when God is out of the picture, even as an unattainable ideal. According to this alternative conception, desire is to be understood as abundance or generosity. Pippin refers in this context to Nietzsche's talk of an overflow of outpouring forces and his use of the image of the beehive overloaded with honey. The implication here is that we have desire in abundance. But to repeat the questions we raised in our discussion of Sartre, where does it come from? What keeps it going? And what is its nature? So I'm moving now on to unrequited love, section four. Pippin is concerned with the question of how this kind of desire is to be sustained. For he associates nihilism with its failure, the flickering out of some erotic flame, as he puts it. And he takes Nietzsche to be concerned with the problem of how desire is to be reignited, given that it's no longer tied to these transcendent values. There's a concession here to Plato and Augustine in the sense that the desire issue is erotic, but the Nietzschean supposedly parts company with this framework by conceiving of desire as an overflow of outpouring forces rather than as a lack to be filled. Now, I've already challenged the assumption that this conceptual shift is a prerogative of the atheist by notice, noting that Levinas is similarly dismissive of the lack model as it applies to our properly human desires. I've noticed also that an analogous conceptual shift is enacted by Plato in the symposium and the notion of an effusive or outpouring force is often used to describe the loving desire which comes from God, this infinite overflow of love in which we participate when we reach out to others. That description comes from Max Scheler, who talks also of an abundance of vital power. And it's interesting that it comes from Max Scheler in the context of attacking Nietzsche's idea that there's something ter terrible and life-denying and nihilistic about Christian love. You know, Scheler wants to say, maybe there is a conception of Christian love that does deserve to be criticized on that score, but properly understood, it escapes the criticism. But I'll come back to that. So, Shayla then talks about this abundance of vital power in the context of talking about God's love. And he quotes Matthew's claim that, quote, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. A paradigm of what it could mean for desire to be productive of value, albeit with no implication that it is the heart's desire that determines what counts as good. Now, Nietzsche, of course, is using Matthew's image of the heart's treasure citing with approval his, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Assuming, however, that theism has been rejected, then the heart's treasure in this context cannot have its source in the infinite overflow of God's love and cannot be understood to be oriented in this direction. It's in the context of tackling the question of how its source and trajectory is to be understood that Pippin appeals to the image taken from Nietzsche of the unrequited lover. Not one who hankers after an inaccessible object, that would be the lack model, but one who loves her unrequited love and which she would, quote, at no price relinquish for a state of indifference. Quote on your sheet. The possibility of such an unrequited love, especially the possibility of sustaining it, turns out to be one of the best images for the question Nietzsche wants to ask about nihilism and our response. Now, the aim here then is to accommodate desire's effusive power without reference to an external source and object, God's infinite desire, love. The image of the unrequited lover offers a model for what it could be for such desire to be sustained. But only if the object of desire is the desire itself rather than some inaccessible object. So the idea here, here seems to be that if we had explained the possibility of desiring a desire for its own sake rather than for, sake of, for the sake of its inaccessible object, 
then we should have an explanation of how there could be a self-generating desire, which is not to be comprehended in lack-involving terms. Sorry, this is so complicated. I was thinking as I was reading that sentence, how can anybody understand it? Um, now, Levinas seems to have some such picture in mind when, in the context of defending his own anti-lack conception of desire, he says that it, quotes, nourishes itself with its hunger and has nothing to do with wanting food. But it's fundamental to his position that something comes to the desiring subject from without, which she can receive and accept, to revert to Sartre's description of the position to be avoided. And Levinas concludes on this basis that desire has its source in something beyond the desirer, which animates the desire. This something, its object, is referred to as the desirable, the other, the most high, the invisible, the transcendent, infinity, and desire thus understood is described as revelation. We're left in no doubt about its theistic significance. So Levinas commits the cardinal sin as far as our atheist protagonists are concerned. Crucially, however, he agrees that we must reject the lack conception of desire, as he puts it, desires not an appeal to food, and has nothing to do with wanting completion. Quotes, it desires beyond everything that can simply complete it. He agrees also that the desire at issue here is fundamental to our humanity. The idea that it is beyond any appeal for food allows Levinas to reject the idea that God is there simply to satisfy us. Indeed, he wants to deny that God's there to satisfy in any sense at all. This going hand in hand with a further claim, and this is important, that the desire's object serves to hollow out the desire rather than to fill it. Quote, the true desire is that which the, des that which the desired does not satisfy but hollows out. So it's as if the object of the desire is somehow making the desire grow and grow, it's expanding into its object rather than, than being filled by its object and disappearing in the way that it would be according to the lack model. Levinas is trying to capture what it means for desire for God to be insatiable, albeit in a framework which involves a rejection of the lack model. Desire is insatiable on the lack model in the sense that it fails to reach the desired object and is ever present for that reason. And the trajectory is something like that. You just can never get to the thing that you really want to get to. We're to suppose that satisfaction would bring it to an end. You know, when you got to the unattainable object, you'd no longer desire. On the alternative Levinasian model, by contrast, desire is insatiable in the sense that it is animated by something beyond the subject, something which he says, fills us with higher thoughts rather than food, and which cannot in any case be grasped as an object. The idea here is that we move towards God only insofar as we're motivated to be moral. And Levinas would reject any attempt to reduce the relevant desire to a desire for fulfilment. We've also moved away from the Sartrean idea that desire is to be defined in opposition to God, Levinasian desire is essentially God-involving. He is an externalist about desire in this respect. Although, to repeat, God is experienced in and through the desire as opposed to as an object. And in this loving movement, which leads us away from our selfish concerns and towards the other person, hence the importance of morality. So it follows from all of this that there are two senses in which Levinasian desire counts as creative. First, it is constantly renewed and hollowed out by its independently desirable object, where this involves the subject being attracted in this direction. Second, and in line with the requirement that God cannot be represented as an object, this attraction is expressed in the subject's motivation to be moral. God is known at the level of action 
rather than contemplation. To know God is to know what is to be done, he says. Levinas can therefore grant with Sartre that creative desire is tied up with the question of value. He can say also that value has its source in the subject, meaning by this that the desiring subject is motivated to bring value to the world and that the weight of responsibility is on her shoulders in this context. Levinas talks of God hiding his face to demand the superhuman of man, kind of a Levinasian Ubermensch here. What he denies, however, is that the subject's desire determines what counts as valuable in the first place. On the contrary, the desiring subject is conscious of good and the law, as he puts it, and filled with the higher thoughts which come from an acknowledgement of God's greatness. We're told here that spirituality is offered up as absence, although this is not intended to compromise the idea that God is real and concrete. You know, God is experienced through this movement towards the other person, not as a kind of object up there. Talk of God's absence returns us to Sartre, who's obsessed with God's absence. And there's a sense in which he too seeks to exploit this absence as an opportunity for erecting an ethics. The difference, however, is that he takes God's absence to be equivalent to non-existence and concludes on this basis that there's no genuine love in the world and no hope for fulfilment either. Levinas is happy to grant that fulfilment must elude us, but this is because he rejects the lack model of desire seeing the desire for fulfilment as just one more expression of egoism. Furthermore, and in contrast to Sartre, he wants to say that there is genuine love and goodness in the world, but only because it contains desiring beings like ourselves who are motivated to be moral. I mean, he grants also that the world is also a pretty evil and horrid place. You know, one crucial example for him being the Holocaust. So, there, are, there is hope because there are desiring beings like ourselves who are capable of bringing value to the world. In such a context, we do God's work. The most significant example for Levinas being when we stand in moral relations to others. It's at this level of interaction that we are said to express the infinite. There's another really neat quotation from Simone Weil, um, that I try to get into every single paper that I ever give. And she talks, and it's an extract from her diaries, where she talks about the importance of having God on the side of the subject rather than the object. God is on the side of the subject in the sense that, as she goes on to say, the subject is descending in love towards the other person. And that's exactly the kind of thing that Levinas has in mind. And Levinas agrees with Sartre that we are wholly responsible in this context. So I'm now on section four. There are just two short sections left. Um, atheism again. Levinas offers a picture of striving without the illusion of a lack to be filled. But his position confronts a seemingly obvious difficulty, namely that it presupposes the truth of theism. Yet it's a non-negotiable premise of our atheist protagonists that theism is unsustainable and that our only hope in the face of the abyss is to be able to make sense of a conception of desire and hence meaningful life and value which is shorn of any reference to God. Hence the requirement for a conception of desire which is self-sustaining in an atheistic sense. <coughs> Now, the truth of atheism is taken for granted in such discussions, but it's worth emphasising that this has not been established, and it's certainly not established by anything said by Nietzsche, Sartre, or their latter-day disciples. After all, Levinas himself goes on about God's absence, but he would insist, as Paul Moser has recently put it, that the true God is hardly in, quotes, the trivial entertainment business regarding our coming to know his existence and that he's made present, if at all, at the level of morality. Now, and this theme has been very important for a lot of my work, conceding this point narrows the gap between atheism and theism. 
and I mean Levinas himself talks about how important atheism is it somehow takes us away from false gods and idolatry now, atheism is the first crucial step in the direction of God so we narrow the gap between atheism and theism but it's surely incumbent upon us and me to consider whether a properly atheistic position could be made good in this context and what the implications are for an understanding of desire value and humanity in this context too we want to be able to say that desire is self-nourishing and in such a way that there is a creation of value in some sense. Now, the most radical option, as I've suggested, is to say that nothing is objectively valuable and that the agent's desire creates any value in its object. Now, there's a question of how such desire could be sustained. Mark Platz has a really brilliant paper where he calls into question the idea that this kind of desire could be sustained. Um, it's called Moral Reality and the End of Desire, written back in 1981. So there's a question of how such desire could be sustained. Um, you know, that's contentious that it can't, but even if it were possible to sustain it, it's unclear that it could support a properly human existence. To be sure, to be sure, you might be thinking, there is a danger here of begging the essential question. And the Nietzschean could respond that it should not be assumed that a properly human existence involves embodying value in the moral sense with which Levinas is concerned, creating value in this sense. Now, such a response suggests a move away from radical subjectivism. Some values are clearly better than others. And the Nietzschean could add that Levinasian value, and more generally the values of Judeo-Christianity, warrant rejection because they're anti-life. This makes sense of Nietzsche's obsession with the future of humanity, although it raises the question of the limits of the morality under attack. After all, Shaler's conception of authentic Christian love sounds a lot like Nietzsche's will to power, and will to power has been interpreted so, so as to suggest that Nietzsche, no less than Levinas, is offering, offering up a spirituality of absence. Understood from this perspective, it's unhelpful to insist that the real difference comes with the rejection of God. You know, we're just entirely unclear about what it means to bring God into the equation or to leave him out, or at least I am. So finally, just picking up the pieces. In a paper on the abyss, Grace Jansen is concerned with the question of how the nihilist's loss of value might be transformed into possibilities for new growth. This is the question with which we have been wrestling, the central issue being whether this new growth could be sustained at the level of desire and in the absence of God. Towards the end of her paper, Jansen suggests that perhaps Heidegger's right when he says that only a God can save us now. She quickly adds, however, that quotes, God will come only as love is born within us, only as we ourselves become divine. Her paper as a whole is concerned to defend this possibility and to do so with reference to the conception of the abyss assumed by some medieval mystics. Her focus is Hadovich of Antwerp. According to this conception, the abyss refers to the unfathomable abyss of the divine nature and the human heart, rather than the hellish groundlessness exploited by the likes of Sartre and Nietzsche. And Jansen seeks to exploit this conception in order to effect a reconfiguration of nihilism. Yes, we face the abyss and thank the Lord for that, seems to be the general idea. Now, it should be clear from my discussion that the real problem is determining whether this reconfiguration is permitted in the first place and what it really amounts to. I've argued that we're entitled to move beyond Sartre's framework, at least in the sense that we do not have to accept his conception of desire as lack or the related assumption that we're fated to pursue an impossible ideal. So hell can be avoided to this degree at least, and we can surely question his insistence that the world which stands before us hath really neither joy nor love nor light, not his words. This is not to suggest that atheism has been refuted. The point is simply that we're not obviously in hell. My Nietzschean agrees that we must move beyond Sartre in these respects. His aim being to affect the transition from abyss one, hell, 
to Abyss 2, heaven, if you want to put it in those terms, from the resources of the human heart alone, as if we ourselves are infinite. This is the interesting move, and I've sought to determine the different things it could mean, whilst narrowing the gap between this op option and its theistic rival. I mean, I hope it's been made clear that I have huge sympathy for this kind of move. I've questioned the most radical interpretation of the Nietzschean position, value as reducible to desire, for it's surely just one more expression of the Sartrean desire to be God. Janssen, of course, is happy to talk of our becoming divine when love is born within us, but she's not suggesting that God has been cast aside in favour of man and is more properly understood to be articulating, a la Levinas, the sense in which we're caught up in the love of God. It's been fundamental to what I've said, that our creative activity, our value-making, value has its source in something beyond us and must operate from within this constraint. So we do not create the values which attract us at the level of desire. And not all of our desires are oriented toward the good in any case. It surely makes sense to say that we are shown to be lacking in these respects. And this brings me to my final point, which is that Deleuze and others notwithstanding, there's an insight in the lack model of desire, which we can ignore only at the cost of reverting to Sartre's impossible ideal, paradoxical though that sounds. Crucially, however, this model, this lack model, is now articulated from within an alternative framework, which involves a denial of the Sartrean assumption that we're hitting a brick wall in this context, ever fated to remain out of touch with what we really want. The other important, because we're now somehow in touch with the love of God or goodness, if you want to spell all of this out in more realist terms. The other important implication, which follows on from the idea that desire for God is hollowed out by its object rather than eliminated, is that although it makes sense to say that the relevant lacks, or some of them, are capable of elimination, this occurs, if at all, only as the desire for God expands. And I'm thinking here about, you know, some of our more horrible desires, like the desire to um, ruin somebody's life for the hell of it, or something like that. And the, the idea would be that um, as the desire for God or good expands within us, then those other desires are somehow eliminated. I mean, John McDowell makes this point in a rather different context by talking about the way in which some motives are silenced when we get onto the desire for goodness. Now, this, I contend, is what it really means for the desiring subject to be creative, just this sense in which we have this ever-expanding desire within us. Um, and then the final sentence here, going back to Deleuze, desire, who except priests are entitled to call it creative. And I'm just being deliberately provocative here in this final sentence. I'm not suggesting that I've refuted Deleuze's position. I'm just hoping to have made a case for saying that it cannot be taken for granted. Thank you.